Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Here we are in dog days of July. It is the uh, the doldrums of summer, isn't it? Oh my gosh! I tell you what. I mean, it's. I think you said it the other day. You get out. You go outside. Work early in the morning, and in the afternoon, you, you see what's on Netflix. Yeah, that and uh, with the heat and humidity, you know, thunderstorms pop up. The forecast is just wacky, right? Oh and, yeah. Uh, it's, it's tough to plan something, you get halfway through something, you get rained out. But uh, it is what it is. Hey, we have a couple special guests here for our dog days in July, right? We do. Age, be, age before beauty. So it's only suitable that we uh, introduce you to our dogs. We have we have Herbert, also known as Peach, uh, here. And this is Blue, even though he's a red dog. And they're both fishless. And uh, you've seen Blue, and you've seen both these dogs in some previous episodes. but. Uh, we're going to get him to try to stay for the whole episode this time. So bless you. Food's a big well, motivator. Yeah, yeah. So as long as we got food, I think we got a chance. But uh, what's, uh, you know, we got some exciting news before we get into the episode. Yeah, you got a nice hat there. Where, where'd you get that? You know, these are some nice hats. Um, so let's talk about our newest sponsor. And I know we've teased this, uh, but this is the absolute first episode that you'll see the Nose Jammer advertisement um, at the at the prefix of this episode. So we are uh, deeply, deeply in debt and, and blessed and honored to have Nose Jammer as one of uh, Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses sponsors. That's right. So we're, uh, we're wearing some merch and um, we've got some Nose Jammer here and uh, they've been gracious to send us some of their products and um, There'll be more about that as far as share. We want to share that with our audience. That's right. right. And uh, so there'll be more on that. But um, you know, no shammer. That's where it's at. You know, with that, uh, if you're a lover of nose jammer like we are, if you would send us a quick email at Midwest Hunting and Outdoors at gmail.com and tell us why you like it so much, we will send you. Free, we'll pick, we'll pick up the postage and we'll send you a can of nose jam. And uh, we'll feature your comments on one of our future shows. Yeah, so again, we're big fans. We're just not selling this stuff. We're, we're big fans of it and uh, support it 100%. And uh, we'd love to hear your story and, and uh, build on it. We'll reward you for it. Yeah, I mean, to show you how much we believe in their product, I mean, we, uh, we, have, we put an episode together called Stinky Honey. And uh, it, it featured uh, predominantly Nose Jammer and how we use it amongst a bunch of other products. And uh, I'm going to just tell you, Nose Jammer is the bomb. So, so with that, as part of Dog Days, we have kind of a mixed set of topics here that we'd like to talk to you guys about. Um, we talked about the news new uh, the uh, new sponsor but with that what we thought we'd do is give you an update on some of the past projects that we've done so um, one of them was dove plots so we did a dove plot um, we put in a, a plethora of free seed that we got from pheasants forever of uh, sunflower and uh, we put an electric fence around it because last year we had problems with the deer eating all the, the sunflowers that they popped up. The electric fence did its job, but I don't think we're seeing 
we're not seeing the amount of sunflowers that we'd hope to see. Hi Joel, we're doing a quick updates on just some of our past projects and what we have up here is our, our dove food plot that uh, that you and I worked on and we did it and I, I would say I did it in a bit of a hurry. Um, I had to put up, I've been on this out on this uh, assignment that's kind of taken me away so whenever I'm home I only have a limited amount of time. And so I came in here, put up the electric fence, which we're going to do a episode on that in, uh, in the future to help some folks. And I tilled this area, added some uh, space per, you know, Kevin Anderson's direction, and uh, which he did for me. And then what we did is we, we planted, uh, planted some sunflowers. And uh, we put some sorghum in here as well. I did not get a chance to spray it. I knew that that was a risk. And what you can see here now is, is I would say, uh, not the amount of success that I would like to see. We have a lot of uh, ordinary ragweed uh, that's taking place, a lot of grass. And there are some sunflowers in there, but uh, not, what we're, not what we're looking for for dove hunting, for sure. So we've got a bunch over here that's still coming up, but uh, next year, we're going to apply the learnings, and the learnings are going to be really. We're going to we're going to do a full kill um, before we do the plant, and uh, we'll see how it comes out. But the electric fence has done a great job of keeping the deer out. Yeah, and we'll put some video in this episode um, of the dove, dove plot. But um, you know, again, there's always learnings, and there's always next year. I would tell you that I don't think the dove plot is um, a total loss. Um, we're hoping, I'm hoping anyway, that we're going to get some bird, uh, birds drawn in there and we can get some shooting in. But it's not what we pictured in our mind. So, how about food plot updates, Joel? I mean, how, how's you talking about your sunflowers? How about your food plots? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've got four or five different food plots of various sizes. They can be food plots, or I call them kill plots in the, in the timber. Um, the biggest food plot I have is about two acres and it's corn and it's head high or above and when I was out there just a couple days ago I'm seeing tassels and super happy with the corn crop from a food plot standpoint. Uh, the other food plots I started with uh, um, soybeans and um, had, had mixed luck with them. Again. Um, just not coming up, not getting the yield, not getting the population growing that I needed to. Again, it's pretty shady areas in some places. So I, I two weeks ago went back in and hand tossed in some Ladino clover, and I was just looking at it yesterday, and it's starting to come up. Good thing in the fall, I'll come back and put in some brassicas, some kitchen sink, and some things like that to uh, supplement the soybean. So in general, I would say I'm pretty happy um, with with my food plots and I'm even happier with the weather pattern that we're seeing with uh, getting rain in this. Yeah, yeah, good. You? Yeah, so I would tell you my, so we put four bags of soybeans on, you know, two and a half acre food plot. And uh, again, uh, I haven't been around to do the appropriate spraying, so there's a disclaimer. But the weeds were, gosh, I'm telling you what, 20 to 1? 20 to 1 for every soybean plant we saw. Three weeks. So I ended up mowing it down. Uh, it looks like a turf football field right now. And uh, I am thinking about what my alternative plans are going to be. I, uh, I have some ideas. I'll share those out a little later. But, uh, but that kind of moves us back into, I, we don't see a lot of turkeys on our property. Uh, I think your your place is like the turkey super, and uh, you know we did that we did that episode with Jim Coffee here, you know this spring, this early spring, and we were talking about how across the state of Iowa and even the nation we're not seeing a lot of turkeys. So the DNR has actually put out a turkey survey, uh, and I'm actually going to read this because uh, we use this. 
for our audio subscribers as well. And we'll put it in the, we'll put it in the YouTube video so you'll Perfect. see a subscreen in that uh, for the website. But um, yeah, it'd be good to talk to. Them. Uh, so what it is is www.surveygizmo.com slash forward slash s3 forward slash 2115256 forward slash Iowa Wild Turkey Reports. Yeah, and I'm sure if you Googled it, we haven't tried it, but if you Googled uh, Iowa 2021 Iowa Turkey Survey, you, you, you get to it like now. Uh, but again, we'll try to embed as much of those links as we can, and we'll certainly put that, that in there. So. so I've actually used that link. Uh, I reported, I've seen a couple of toms, and today we saw a hen. Yeah. Uh, but here's the disturbing thing is, is on my cameras, etc., I've not seen a single pool. How about yourself? Yeah, I have not seen any checks or bolts uh, yet here today. So um, that is concerning. Yeah, it is concerning. Uh, just yesterday, coming back from the cabin, I was talking about that and uh, saw five different turkeys, three toms and two hens in th three different locations, and uh, not a check. Not a check. I saw a pair of twin deer and a single uh, doe with a single fawn. So a lot of fawns out there, that's good. That's good. But from a turkey standpoint, concern. Yeah, that's a problem. Iowa Missouri Hybrids has been a family owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Kiyosakwa, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs. Give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Uh, so then along the turkeys, you know, they, I think they got this idea from the pheasant survey that they do every year. And uh, I saw a clip from the DNR. The DNR, again, been great, great friends to us on our podcast um, about the pheasant population. The pheasant population for 2021, they say, is supposed to be very similar to last year, maybe even better. And we saw a few birds last year, so I'm anxious to, uh, I'm anxious to try to do a little hunting for, for the, for the ringnecks next year. I saw a couple of ringnecks on the road when I was driving back. Uh, on that same trip from back from the cabin, and uh, so that was good to, good to see. Um, I've also been seeing some, some quail and hearing some quail, quite a few quail yeah, that's that I've fun. been hearing, so um, that, that's a good sign. So I've been doing, uh, I mean that's just great news, so I'm hoping to draw some pheasant into our property with some of the changes we've been making from a habitat perspective. We put in some, some four foot and some seven foot uh, fields of CRP and uh, as with uh, we did a we've done a couple episodes on CRP and uh, with that um, you they do a cost share this is kind of how it works you you go in and you buy the seed you prepare the ground for planting that might be your tilling or cultivating and then you spray spray your field down and then after that you plant it and then you have to do a few mows to contain the weed seeds and uh, I'm going to probably end up mowing three times this year just due to the rain I think and uh, and then what you have to do is you take your seats into uh, the USDA office and they they will do a cost share with you and uh, usually it's a 50 percent cost share and uh, you know i was having an interest, interesting discussion with the usda office today so evidently so this would be useful for you folks who have your own property so evidently if you have any tillable ground you have to report to the usda office by july 15th of every year it doesn't matter what state you're in by July 15th of every year, what you have on 
on those grounds. So is it set aside? Are you just letting it stand? Or did you plant something? But it doesn't matter. If you don't plant anything, you still have to self-report. Uh, they can get a little testy if you if if you don't self-report. And obviously, so I'm just beating the deadline this year. And uh, anyway, so we got into some discussion. I was talking to a uh, super friendly gal, knowledgeable up there, and uh, I was asking her. I said, "Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about tilling up a small area that's never been tilled in. It's lightly wooded. Uh, when I say lightly wooded, I mean." less than one inch trees and uh, I said and I was bringing up to her Joel I said hey do I when I do that do I have to self self report that and she goes oh absolutely and she goes even one step further she goes before you do any of that you have to fill out a 1026 report 1026 report <laughs> and, and uh, I got a 1026, and she goes, yep, it comes to us first, then, then it goes to the NRCS office for approval to make sure it's not on highly erodible land, and then pending approval will dictate whether you can do that or not. And there just happened to be, there just happened to be a farmer right next to me, and he looked at me and goes, you thought you owned your property. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, that's, that's an interesting thought, I didn't realize that, so, um, you have any thoughts on that? No, it's important to know, but um, it's also, you know, I don't know. I, I struggle with it's your property, and I and I get the conservation piece of it. You can't do anything you want on your property, but you know, I, I struggle with if I want to put a little food plot in my timber that I've got to go talk to the USDA USDA to do it. You know, technically. Well, and it's a slow process. I mean, one of the things she said, she goes, hey, if you want to do it this season, she goes, you would have had to put in that in spring and hope that that had been approved. Yeah. And heck, if it got by fall and they didn't have it approved, I'd already have it in. I'd be able to show them all the nice <laughs> food plot I put in. And yeah, nothing moves fast with the government. So the USDA is no different than that, right? So. You know, I feel for those folks, you know, because they the rules are ever-changing. And uh, they got a tough job trying to stay on top of it. It is, and they have to deal with uh, all different situations. Sure, you know, we're, we're food plotters and small potatoes compared to you know other things that they have to deal with. So yeah, that's right. been good to us. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. So I wanted to share that. Uh, gosh, I thought we had another topic I wanted to talk about. You know, if I can go back to food plots here a second, um, it, you know, in, last year I had beans where I had my corn this year, and the corn's coming up great, uh, but I've still got my water hemp problem. And uh, it, it doesn't look as like it's a big problem um, because the corn's six foot tall and the water hemp is less than that. And my hope is, and that was my plan in my mind, is that the corn would keep it choked down and and maybe even kill some of it off before it seeds. Um, but if you're having issues with water hemp, and again, we took some video of what water hemp looks like, and we'll embed that in this episode. Um, you know, we, I would encourage you, from my own experience going through it, go up to your local ag service and, and talk to them about it. Bring up a plant to make sure it is water hemp. But what I had success with last year, now this will, uh, what he's, he asked my his first question was is it liberty ready soybeans or corn mine were not but they were roundup ready so i think with liberty um, ready soybeans and corn liberty will take care of water hemp. but if you have roundup ready um, what i had success with was a chemical cocktail herbicide cocktail of um, blazer yep. roundup and some crop oil and again i don't have the recipe here with me um, so I'm not, I don't want to mislead people. Again, I, I encourage you to go up and talk to your ag service, but it definitely took care of the uh, water hemp. The soybeans took a hit for about a week, and they came right back out of it, but the water hemp uh, really, really killed it. So this year I'm not doing that because uh, when I did go up and talk to them, they, they said I would need a different herbicide for corn than my soybeans. 
um, this year. And um, you know, I'm kind of experimenting with the corn, kind of keeping it down and in check. So just just a highlight on the water now. I've got a couple patches in this one field. Uh, I'm hoping that the CRP will choke it out. That's what I'm hoping. We'll see. Yeah, I hope I hope it does. And you mowed it, right? Yep. So I think that's a key piece of it too. Is if you can mow it, then um, you know I think it gives the plants a chance to come back and feed it out. So that's good. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, so. Got a round stem, right? Really long tap root. Which that's kind of the key because that thing goes feet, feet, feet in the ground. Uh -huh. And when it's dry, it just it's getting all the it's getting Moisture. all the water that's out there. Well, Joel, we, uh, we did this creek crossing here last year about this time. Josh came down and he did some excavating for us. And we put in four posts, four posts into the ground. And uh, I was pretty sure that that was going to hold it for a while. But gosh, I tell you what, we have such a watershed here. And... Uh, it was easily, we got five inches in two hours, I think seven inches that day. And we had such an amount of water that was draining into this area. And uh, walking over here, you can see, I mean, the water's all laid down, all the way to here. Right? So from me to you and a little further behind you, easily 30 feet. So, it was just too much force, you know, coming from straight on and even around it, washed out, washed out a little bit of the bank, and you see the amount of concrete that we had up here that's washed down, downstream. So we've got uh, Josh from JD Excavating coming in, and he's going to, uh, we're going to redo this. And we're going to do something a little different. We're going to get 12, 14 foot poles. And we're going to dig a trench and lay in some concrete and then put those posts right in with, those, with that concrete. And uh, that should provide us a little more strength um, for the next time we get that. We talked in basics, so we talked about water hemp. Uh, let's talk about future episodes. Uh, what do we got coming up? I think we got some exciting things coming up. Um, so we've got a couple episodes already. Um, developed they're waiting to be released. One I know is invasive species. So the two that uh, it's focusing on are um, wild garlic mustard, which I will guarantee you if you haven't sprayed for this you've got it. You just gotta identify it and know it's there. And then the uh, the second one is honeysuckle. So uh, two big ones that I've got some passion around and I hate immensely and they're living in my life, but uh, we know there's more invasive species out there and we'll probably have some future episodes on those. Yeah. Um, the other one is uh, around uh, oyster mushrooms. Yep. And I think that's out there as we speak today. And so that's a, a quick one and a really good, it's been a great year for oyster mushrooms with the temperatures <laughs> and, the, and the moisture. Uh, we're, uh, we're killing them and I got a text from J.B. Hunter Extraordinaire with a picture of a tree saying, man, it's a great year for oyster yeah, he, He's found a couple more trees. I mean, God, he's got a ton. Yeah. So, great year for oyster mushrooms. We're talking uh, potential here of uh, doing some things with the hatchery at Rathbun uh, Lake. That should be fun. Pretty fun, pretty exciting. And uh, we're talking uh, some erosion control around uh, silt fences. So, just a few things that uh, we're dabbling in and then uh, you know, we still want to get with the NDA, National Deer Association, and QDMA, which is the Quality Deer uh, Management Association, and uh, we're still working on getting that. Yeah, that should be really super good, too. I mean, talking about how you build just great habitat, and then talking about uh, 
it'll be interesting about talking facts on culling of deer. Is that a is that an acceptable practice? Is it does it work? Um, I have my own suspicions or thoughts. Maybe is a better way, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know very much about those organizations, so I'm excited to learn from them and then really understand their approach. Um, and maybe something that I've been missing out on up, up till now. So, yeah. Um, interesting. But that's that's what I know, Tim. All right. I think this is a wrap. All right. All right. So with that, be safe. Be safe. Have fun. fun and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors. Oh, look at that. We had you yet. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.